This video is brought to you by my kind Patreon supporters and channel members. If you enjoy my content and seek to take your support a step further, you can freely join my Patreon or become a channel member, with several added benefits. With that out of the way, enjoy today's content. The Second World War in the areas of the former Yugoslavia is not an easy topic to tackle, a topic that has stunned many historians of the Second World War. This is because this conflict is not as black and white as it may seem. You had collaborationist governments, then resistance movements, and then even movements which both collaborated and resisted, and also to take into account the many smaller movements and organizations with their own special goals. Overall, it was a hot mess. Everyone has probably heard of Tito's Partisans, the most successful resistance movement in Axis-occupied Europe. The independent state of Croatia under Ante Pavlic, which carried out brutal extermination of Serbs, Gypsies and Jews, and in the process shocking even the Germans with their brutality. The Chetnik movement under Draža Mihailović, aiming to restore the Kingdom of Yugoslavia with Serbian irredentist views. The Hanjar Division, the special Bosniak SS division tasked with combating resistance in Bosnia, and so on. However, there is one collaborationist government people know extremely little about, and that was the Serbian collaborationist government of national salvation under Milan Nedic. The reason why so many people know so little about this part of Serbian history is thanks to Serbian history revisionism, wanting people to forget about the fact that Serbs, while still suffering from genocide in the independent state of Croatia, still collaborated with the Nazi regime. Modern-day Serbian nationalists try to portray Serbs as only resisting the Nazi occupation and fighting them wherever possible, that Serbs were just as big victims of the Nazi regime like Jews. This historical revisionism was pretty effective, especially in Israel with former President Benjamin Netanyahu stating that Serbs were just as big victims in Nazi-occupied Europe as Jews. And I am here to finally break this revisionism, to showcase the side Serbian nationalists don't want you to know about, the collaborationist side of Serbs in World War II. And believe me, there is a lot, a lot to talk about here. So much so that this will only be part one of three videos. This one will focus on the general collaborationist government and military formations. The second part will focus on the Chetnik collaboration with Nazi forces. And finally, the third part will conclude with how Serbs assisted in the Holocaust. I will provide the most detailed information about the government of national salvation YouTube has seen, at least yet. Before I get into the video, I will make one thing very explicitly clear. This series is not meant to demonize the Serbian people in general, nor am I trying to say that Serbs always collaborated with the Nazis. When it comes to the topic of World War II in Yugoslavia, every single ethnic group had both collaborators and resistance, and my people, the Bosniaks, are no exception to this. We also had our own collaborators which took part in atrocities committed on Serbs and other people, and I am not ashamed to talk or acknowledge this dark part of our history. But the fact that Serbs are deliberately twisting history to erase their collaborationist past and refusing to acknowledge it is the exact reason why I have decided to make this series. As I have stated, every ethnic group in that period, Serbs included, had both resistance fighters and collaborators. And it is that exact collaborationist part of Serbian history in the Second World War I am willing to explore in possibly my biggest project on this channel. With that out of the way, sit back and enjoy this video. After the Tripartite Pact was signed by Germany, Italy and Japan, the German government started pressuring the Kingdom of Yugoslavia to sign it as well. And after Bulgaria signed it, the pressure only intensified. The fact of the matter is, Hitler and Germany had no plans of splitting up Yugoslavia and establishing a Croatian puppet state like after the invasion. Quite the opposite, in fact. 
Many in the German leadership held a pro-Serbian and pro-Yugoslav stance. One of the people who held such views was Paul Schmidt, who was the chief of the press section of Germany's foreign ministry. In the post-war period, a German intelligence officer wrote about Schmidt's intentions and how he used the press to further the pro-Yugoslav sentiment among Germans. Quote, his primary objective being to awaken a sympathetic interest in Hitler and the other leaders for Yugoslavia and, in particular, for the Serbs. He lauded the centuries-old and heroic struggle of the valiant Serbian people against the Turkish oppressor, the military virtues of the warlike Serbs, their chivalrous characteristics and so on, and succeeded in making quite a plausible case for a moral relationship which he professed to see between Germans and Serbs. With these means he greatly strengthened the pro-Serb feeling which already existed among the German leaders. Hitler himself repeatedly declared that he regarded an alliance with the brave and warlike Serbs as an object particularly worth striving for. The Croats, on the other hand, had no real influential man in Berlin to plead their case. The Crown Regent Prince Paul already held three crown sessions regarding the tripartite pact and on the third one it was agreed that Yugoslavia would sign the pact and join on the side of Germany, with the cabinet voting in favor of this decision 16 to 3. Already even before the pact was signed, there were rumors that a coup would be carried out if the government decided to go through with it. But the government ignored these rumors and officially signed the Tripartite Pact in Vienna on March 25th. Only two days later, during the early hours of March 27th, a group of Serbian officers carried out a coup, removing Prince Paul from his position of power and installing the 17-year-old King Peter II. The Serbian foreign minister was then replaced with Momčilo Ninčić, who was previously the president of the German Yugoslav society, and after a couple hours, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill declared, quote, Early this morning, the Yugoslav nation found its soul. In Serbian nationalist historiography, the March 27th coup is seen as the resistance of the Serbian people to accept the alliance with Germany and pursue a more pro-allied stance. But this coup was not carried out because of the resistance of the Serbian people. Rather, it was carried out by the British intelligence agency and Serbian military officers on the payroll of the British. Now this may sound absurd at first, but if you look at the details and think about it, it makes a lot more sense that this coup was not exactly carried out due to anti-Axis sentiment. However, there is one thing both the British intelligence agency and the Serbian military officers had in common regarding Yugoslavia. Both sides wanted the removal of Prince Paul and his government. The British obviously wanted to remove him in order to stop Yugoslavia from falling into the hands of the Axis powers, but the motive of the officers was more regarding his policies rather than him having a positive view of the Axis. Dusan Simović, one of the officers who would play a crucial role in the coup, already planned to overthrow Paul all the way back in 1938 when the Yugoslav government was negotiating a concordat with the Vatican. Another officer who played a crucial role in the coup, Borivoje Mirković, was also strongly opposed to Paul before the signing of the pact. Mirković and Simović thought of Paul as too liberal, and after he made concessions to the Croats by establishing the Bandovina of Croatia, their resentment towards him only increased. So it's extremely unlikely that their motives were driven by anti-Axis sentiment, but rather anti-Paul sentiment. What makes this even more plausible is the fact that in Mirković's quarters, he proudly displayed a photograph signed by none other than Hermann Göring. The British, on the other hand, were involved in the preparations of the coup all the way back in 1940. The British made contacts in the Yugoslav military and political circles through business contacts and diplomacy. The British intelligence agency provided funds to and bribed key leaders of the Serbian Agrarian Party and the Democratic Party, and months before the coup, the British had delivered a railroad car full of weapons and radio communication equipment to the Serbian Agrarian Party. 
The interesting thing is, after the new Mirkovic government was established, the new foreign minister, Momchilo Ninčić, met with the German ambassador and assured him that Yugoslavia was going to uphold the tripartite pact and not back out of it. Not only that, but the new government released all members and supporters of the pro-Axis and fascist Boer movement, previously imprisoned other Poles government. Despite being reassured that Yugoslavia was gonna stay in the tripartite pact, Hitler had very little faith in the new government, even going as far as to brand them as communists. He then resolved to impose his very own brand of stability in the Balkans. The March 27th coup was never so clearly anti-Axis as it was anti-Pol and anti-Croatian. Despite revisionist attempts to portray pre-World War II Serbia as staunchly anti-fascist, Serbia indeed bred its own fascist movements and had a pro-Axis oriented view. As I mentioned previously, the Germans had no real plan what to do with Yugoslav territory before the invasion, so the German leadership came up with a plan during the 12-day invasion of the nation. The Germans initially considered putting Dragiša Cvetković, the Prime Minister of Yugoslavia before the coup, in charge of a new collaborationist government. Even though Cvetković pledged his allegiance to Hitler, in the end, it conflicted with Hitler's plan to divide Yugoslavia. Numerous Serbian pro-Nazi politicians, Dmitri Ljotić, Milana Cimović, Tanas Jedinić, just to name a few, held daily meetings in order to determine the composition of the new Serbian government and regularly kept the Germans informed on their conclusions. On August 13th, under the leadership of Velibor Jonić, over 500 Serbs, including some of the country's most prominent and influential figures, released a document titled Appeal to the Serbian Nation, which called on Serbs to be loyal to the Nazi regime and condemn the partisans. Two weeks after the release of the document, approximately 75 influential Serbian figures held an emergency meeting in Belgrade, where it was finally agreed upon that General Milan Nedic would lead the new Serbian collaborationist government, and the Germans granted permission to Nedic to form his quote-unquote government of national salvation. When discussing the government of national salvation, Serbian nationalists like to claim that this government didn't really have much autonomy and that the internal and external affairs were still managed by the German Reich, and the Serbian leadership didn't exactly have power. However, this claim directly contradicts Jovan Trisic, the then commander of the Serbian gendarmes. Two days after the Nedic government was formed, he made an announcement defining the responsibilities and autonomy of the government. Quote, Beginning with the day of activation of this government, German military forces will not interfere in any interior affair of Serbia, and therefore not in the work of the gendarmes either. Since the German military forces had undertaken, before the creation of the Serbian government, certain actions on the ground in order to prevent communist bands whose action has not been completed, it has been ordered that the German military forces stop their action against these bands as of September 3rd, 1941. The gendarmes shall act entirely autonomously, exclusively in the interests of the Serbian people, according to orders from the Serbian government." End quote. Two days after this order went into effect, nine new army detachments were established under the direct command of Nedic, and in November 1941, Nedic ordered the creation of a unified Serbian command structure with the Germans arming the new Serbian army. And by this point, Nedic's position as the leader of the new Serbian state was solidified. The Serbian State Guard was established in March 1942 by Milan Nedic with the support of SS General August Meissner. The two of them met to discuss the creation of a new Serbian police force with around 15,000 to 16,000 members. The nucleus of the Serbian State Guard were the Serbian Gendarmes, the direct continuation of the Royal Yugoslav Gendarmes. Within three months, the State Guard totaled around 18,000 personnel, and this size was maintained throughout the war. The State Guard routinely executed captured partisans, often with the assistance of Chetniks, 
For example, when six partisans were hanged publicly in the Serbian towns of Valjevo, Uba, and Obrenovac, the Serbian chief of the Valjevo district issued the following report to Nedic's Ministry of Interior, quote, Several thousand people, as well as representatives of the German army, attended the carrying out of the death sentence in all three places. The execution was carried out by our authorities, the Serbian State Guard, and the Chetnik detachments." End quote. A good number of the personnel in the State Guard sympathized with the Chetnik movement, and the only thing that kept their morale up was the dream of the creation of a royalist Greater Serbia. The State Guard provided the Chetniks with intelligence and even logistical support. The Serbian Volunteer Corps was much smaller compared to the Serbian State Guard, at least in the beginning. But it was still highly effective. It was established by Dmitry Ljotic, a pro-Nazi Serbian politician who took part in the talks regarding the new Serbian government. Ljotic had already established ties with the SS all the way back in 1935 and was in good terms with them. The corps was formed as the military branch of his Zbor party, a pan-Serbian fascist party modeled after the Nazi party. For many years, Ljotic's funding came from German industrial firms and intelligence services, and now he was ready to establish his long-awaited military branch. Initially, after the corps was formed, it only had about 600 personnel, but the numbers would only grow more as time went on, and instantly it was sent on military operations alongside the Serbian State Guard against the partisans. Already after a couple of days, the corps caught the attention of Harald Turna, the chief of Nazi civil administration of Serbia. He reported that Ljotic's corps had demonstrated extraordinary results and could be fully trusted. In October 1941, Nedic had appointed Colonel Kosta Mushitsky as head of the Volunteer Corps. Mushitsky, a member of the Zbor party and former aide to King Alexander I, had already proven his loyalty to the Germans by helping them enter Yugoslavia during the invasion. In the same month, the Volunteer Corps participated in the notorious massacre of civilians at Kragujevac, after 10 German soldiers were killed in a partisan ambush. German records indicate that over 2,300 civilians were executed at Kragujevac, with the Volunteer Corps being responsible for rounding up the civilians and giving them over to the Germans. By the end of 1942, the Serbian Volunteer Corps had over 20,000 personnel, and by that time, Milan Nedic had decreed that all officers of the Volunteer Corps would receive salaries according to the law, and Kosta Mushitski had been officially promoted to general. Ever since Nedic's government came into power, he repeatedly advocated the creation of a Greater Serbia in both his public speeches and private discussions with German officials. His plan for expansion was to annex all of Bosnia and Herzegovina, all of Macedonia, all of Montenegro, all of Dalmatia, parts of eastern Slavonia and Albania. In 1943, Nidic and his minister sent him a memorandum titled Explanation of the Necessity of Organizing the Serbian People as a National Community. The memorandum claimed that the Serbian peasants had the greatest role in the history of the Serbian state. Part of the memorandum read, quote, As opposed to the Jewish anarcho-materialist mentality, the Serbs, as well as all other Aryan peoples, are characterized by a natural racial instinct to consider family, nation and the state as the highest spiritual and material values. The constructiveness of Serbian National Socialism is based on the blood connections of the family, the peasant cooperative and the clan." End quote. In this memorandum, Nidic makes it clear that he seeks a pure National Socialist Serbia, which would be organized into a peasant state. Nidic would always praise Serbian peasants as the quote-unquote untouched Serbian race that has no mixed foreign blood. In September 1943, Nidic finally got his long-awaited personal audience in Berlin with Adolf Hitler. He planned on discussing with him the idea of his greater Serbian state, which would be under Hitler's protection. Josef Goebbels had written a note about Nidic's audience with Hitler in his journal, and he wrote, quote, The Serbian Prime Minister, Nidic, had paid a visit to the Fuhrer. 
He acted very obediently and loyally during his visit. The Fuhrer believes he can make good use of him in re-establishing order in Serbia." End quote. In December 1943, Hitler had actually considered Nedić's idea for a Greater Serbia, more specifically, the establishment of a Greater Serbian Federation. But due to Germany's deteriorating military situation by 1944, the Germans had much bigger issues than dealing with the Balkan states. But Nedić was reassured that his idea was to be considered after the war. Already near the end of 1944, Milan Nedić knew that it was only a matter of time until the Soviet Union breached into Serbia together with the partisans. He already started working towards evacuating his government and officers to the German Reich. Soon, the government got the information that German forces would evacuate from Serbia, and at this point, Serbian collaborators had three options. Flee to Germany, submit and join Tito's partisans, or just pretend they never collaborated at all. But the vast majority of soldiers and politicians chose to flee to Germany in order to establish a government in exile. That night, Milorad Nedeljkovic, Nedić's Minister of Economy, wrote a letter to the Ministry's office, and it read, quote, From this moment, martial law has been imposed in Belgrade. The Serbian government will move to Germany in order to take care of its political and national duty there. I inform you and all of the officials that everyone who wants to be evacuated should report at the presidency of the government. Train after train will go non-stop. Belgrade has been encircled, and in a few days, fighting will start from all directions. When Belgrade is occupied by communists and Tito's partisans, all educated people and the economic elite of the Serbian nation will surely be butchered. They must be saved, and that is our task now." End quote. Milan Nedić managed to flee to Austria, where he was eventually captured by the British soldiers. After the war had been won, the British forces handed Nedić over to the partisans in January 1946. Nedić would be then incarcerated in Belgrade on the charges of treason. Knowing his eventual fate, in February 1946, Milan Nedić committed suicide by jumping through his prison window, falling to the ground and meeting his deserved end. In the words of Petar Bajca, who served as an officer of the Serbian State Guard and later wrote a book on Milan Nedić, stated, quote, Milan Nedić collaborated with the occupier. The Serbian State Guard collaborated. The Serbian Volunteer Corps collaborated. The Chetniks, with a few exceptions, collaborated. I, myself, collaborated too. Not one of us did it for the sake of himself, but for the sake of the Serbian people. The government of national salvation is truly an interesting topic to look into, especially for those who are interested in the history of the Balkans. As I mentioned previously, there is not much information on the state on YouTube, let alone in English, so I have decided to present it for the entire world to see and to share my knowledge on this subject. With that, I am ending the first part of Serbia's secret war. Join me next month where I will be exploring the collaborationist past of the Chetnik movement and attempting to explain their complicated alliances. The Chetniks are perhaps one of, if not the, most well-known Balkan nationalist movement in history. Famous for their operations during the Second World War and the Yugoslav Wars, but it was their brutality towards the non-Serbian population which really made them known across the world. But despite this quote-unquote fame, few people really know that much about them, other than that they were just a Serbian nationalist movement. One thing Serbian nationalists and neo-Chetniks really love to repeat is that the Chetnik forces during the Second World War were a resistance movement against the Axis powers, fighting for the liberation of Serbia and Serbs from the German Reich. However, there is a lot more to the Chetniks than just that. While sure, indeed, they did have clashes against the Germans, other times they also collaborated with them. 
Keep in mind that the Chetnik movement was not a fully centralized movement. Almost every Chetnik unit acted independently with their own various alignments. Some supported the Allied powers, while others fought alongside the Germans, and even among Serbian nationalists this is an accepted fact. In this video, I will be focusing more on the Axis aligned side of the Chetnik movement, more specifically three famous Chetnik commanders and their units, Pavle Jurišić, Father Momčilo Jujic, and finally the elephant in the room, Draža Mihailović, the widely accepted leader of the Chetniks. When it comes to Draža in particular, Serbian nationalists and neo-Chetniks loved the claim that he was entirely against Germany and always fought against them, a legacy that is associated with him to this very day. And today, I will focus on breaking that legacy of Mihailović as this great anti-German crusader in the war. Alongside talking about these three Chetnik commanders, I will also give my personal opinion when it comes to the alignment of the Chetnik movement in general and attempt to explain their complicated alliances and what their true goal really was. Before the invasion of Yugoslavia, Pavle Jurišić was a regular Serbian army officer in the Royal Yugoslavian Army. After Yugoslavia was invaded and carved up, Jurišić became a Chetnik commander in Montenegro, and at first his main purpose was to resist the Italian occupation. A few months after the occupation, the Partisans and Chetniks staged a large-scale revolt against the Italians, an event also known as the 13th of July Uprising. In this battle, both Partisans and Chetniks worked together to drive the Italian occupiers out of Montenegro. But in the end, the Italians managed to suppress the revolt and continue their activity in the region. Despite participating in the uprising against the Italians, Jurišić would start to collaborate with them in 1942, meeting up with Italian officers. They quickly came to an agreement that the Italian army would supply Jurišić and aid them in the struggle against the partisan forces. The agreement obliged Jurišić to lead the fight against communism, maintain contact with the Italian army and never attack Italian troops. With Italian support, by 1942, Jurišić and his Chetnik detachments managed to crush the last significant partisan army in Montenegro, and by the end of the same year, the Italian army alongside the Chetniks forced nearly every partisan unit out of Montenegro. After the capitulation of Italy in 1943, Jurišić looked more towards the German Reich and started establishing ties with Dmitry Ljotić and his Serbian volunteer corps. In 1944, with the blessings of both the Germans and Ljotić, Jurišić created the Montenegrin Volunteer Corps, a branch of the Serbian Volunteer Corps. Mila Nedić, together with the Volunteer Corps, provided aid to Jurišić and eventually Nedić would promote Jurišić to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and appointed him as assistant commander of the Serbian Volunteer Corps. Seeing Jurišić's rise to power and how loyal he was to the Axis powers, under the instructions of Adolf Hitler, Jurišić was awarded the Iron Cross on the 11th of October 1944. In 1945, while Jurišić was retreating with his soldiers through the independent state of Croatia, he was ambushed by Croatian soldiers, who captured him along with a few of his men. Jurišić was executed at the Jasenovac concentration camp shortly afterwards, and the location of his grave remains unknown to this very day. Roughly three quarters of Yugoslavia's Serbian Orthodox priests supported the Chetniks throughout the war. One prominent Orthodox clergyman and Chetnik leader was Father Momčilo Jujic, a self-proclaimed Chetnik warlord who operated in northern Dalmatia and western Bosnia. With his Chetniks murdering and mutilating Croatian civilians, terrorizing many Croatian villages. Unlike Jurišić, Jujic instantly started cooperating with the Italians, as he negotiated an official non-aggression pact with them shortly after the occupation. He established a consistent record of cooperation with the Italian authorities in anti-partisan raids. However, as one Italian assessment in 1943 stated, the Italians saw him and his followers as only good for little more than plunder. After Italy capitulated, many of his troops defected to the partisan forces, while the other half instantly started collaborating with the Germans. 
Now, unlike the Italians who strongly supported him, the Germans were wary of Jewish and significantly limited his activities. Seeing how his position was growing weaker and weaker, Jewish established ties and contact with Dmitry Ljotic and urgently appealed to the Germans to permit him and his Chetniks to take refuge in German-occupied Slovenia. At the request of Ljotic, the Germans and the Croatians assisted him in his escape and approved it. There are quite a few records of Jewish activities in 1944, which provide close insight into the nature of Chetnik collaboration with the Germans. The most prominent example was when partisan forces were attacking the Croatian town of Knin. While the Croatian and Germans numbered around 15,000 soldiers, the Chetniks numbered up to 4,500, and together with the Germans and Croats, the Chetniks defended the city against the partisans. After six days of fighting, Jewish was wounded, and on the 1st of December, he sent an emissary to the general of the German 264th Division stationed in Knin with the following message, quote, The Chetnik command with all of its armed forces has collaborated sincerely and loyally with the German army in these areas from September last year. Our common interests demanded this. The command requests that the village of Pajene be the base for supplying our units until a further common agreement is reached." End quote. In the aftermath, the partisans were victorious and Jewish with his Chetniks continued to retreat towards Slovenia. Jewish managed to flee to the United States and, despite being found guilty as a war criminal in 1947, he was never handed over by the United States and he continued to live his life in the USA until his eventual death in 1999. So here we are finally, tackling one of the main figures of Serbian nationalism, an individual who has been subject to lots of revisionism, attempting to rehabilitate his legacy and movement. But I will admit, the Chetniks under the command of Mihailovic initially had indeed planned to resist the German occupation, but they soon found themselves in a very tough spot. By late 1941, Mihailovic's Chetniks effectively had abandoned resistance to the Axis in favor of the struggle against Tito's partisans. The reasons for this drastic transformation is complex, so to say. They were in part due to fear of German reprisals, something Mihailovic was very aware of. He avoided direct confrontation with the German army, knowing very well that this would be the end of him and his movement. Even at the beginning of the German occupation of Serbia, Mihailovic had not only avoided clashes with the Axis, but initiated and maintained contact with the occupation forces and their collaborators. This was something the Germans themselves had confirmed. According to a German analysis from 1941, it noted that the communists formed most of the insurgency against the occupation, while Serbian Chetniks were deliberately avoiding military confrontation. Mihailovic had then decided to establish cooperation with the German army. At his request, the German military command met with him in mid-November, attempting to reach an agreement. This meeting between Mihailovic and the German command ended without an agreement, as Colonel Kogart did not trust Mihailovic, despite Mihailovic stating numerous times in the meeting that his forces never attacked German positions. According to eyewitness accounts, Mihailovic stated to Kogart, quote, I had never issued any order to attack the German forces, just the opposite. All of my orders were directed to avoid that struggle, except when my forces were attacked by the Germans. Thus had it been until that moment, thus would it be in the future, end quote. Even before the November meeting, Mihailovic attempted to establish ties with Serbian collaborators Ljotic and Nedic. In May, he sent an envoy to Belgrade to meet Ljotic and express his interest for cooperation. In August, on the day Nedic's government was formed, Nedic sent a message to Mihailovic looking for cooperation against the partisans. In response, Mihailovic sent a delegation to meet with Nedic in Belgrade. Interestingly enough, Despite attempting to establish ties and cooperation with the Germans, Mihailovic on the other hand also was engaged in talks with Tito regarding a joint Chetnik partisan alliance against the Germans. So, this is where things get a little bit complex. Mihailovic was meeting with Tito to discuss anti-German operations, while on the other hand, even when he offered to cooperate with Tito, 
he also promised to join the Nazis in fighting the partisans. This back and forth, switching from side to side, aiding them back to back would continue all the way into 1945. You had Chetniks and partisans fighting side by side against the Germans in Operation Užice. Then, a few months later, you had the Germans launching a large-scale operation attempting to suppress and capture Mihailovich and his Chetniks. But then suddenly, two years later, you had Mihailovich fighting alongside the Germans in case white against the partisans, completely ignoring the fact that two years earlier, they wanted him dead or alive. So what in the world is going on here? So what were the Chetniks really then? Were they pro-Nazi collaborators or were they a resistance movement? Well, in my personal opinion, I would say that they were neither. The Chetniks were a Serbian royalist and nationalist movement which had its eyes on one single goal. The creation of a greater Serbia. The same way the Germans sought an ethnically pure German state, the Chetniks sought an ethnically pure Serbian state. They contributed to this by executing a policy of genocide against the non-Serbian population, primarily Croats and Bosniaks. The Chetnik ideology was elaborated in the memorandum titled Homogeneous Serbia by Stevan Moljevic. The Chetniks would use Moljevic's work as their unofficial manifesto, and if we take a look at the document, we find this interesting passage, quote, the primary and essential duty of Serbs today is to create and organize a homogeneous Serbia, which must encompass the entire ethnic territory where Serbs live. This goal is necessary for the security, life and survival of Serbia, and if in some regions today we do not have a Serbian majority, those regions must serve Serbia and the Serbian people." End quote. As Moljevic states in the document, its primary concern is not the question of resistance against the Axis powers, but rather the creation of a greater Serbia, and we can definitely link this to the Chetniks. The truth is, the Chetniks collaborated with any side that had the upper hand in any given situation and region. This would explain Mihailovic's alliances with the Germans and Partisans. To him, it wasn't really important who he was working with, as long as that particular side was the best for the Chetniks to ally with in that moment. And we can definitely see this happening not only in Mihailovic's units, but the Chetniks in general. You had certain Chetnik commands which actively fought against the Germans, you had those that almost always collaborated, and then you had those that worked with both sides. That was the true purpose of the Chetniks and their struggle. The dream of a greater Serbian state. It didn't matter to them if they were fighting with the Germans one moment and then switched to the sides of the Allies the other. It was all for the dream of their pure greater Serbian state. And if the Germans in the end came out on top, they would have benefited from the previous collaboration. And the same goes for every single other side in that war. Shortly after the Kingdom of Yugoslavia was occupied and divided by the Axis powers, a swift move to wipe out the Jewish population of Yugoslavia was carried out with the SS and with the help of collaboration governments. Most people are aware of the extermination of Jews in the independent state of Croatia, most notably the Jasnovac concentration camp, where tens of thousands of Jews, Gypsies, Serbs and Communists perished. The same kind of fate awaited the Jews within Nedic regime in Serbia. However, it has always been propagated that it was the Germans who carried out the genocide within Serbia, that the Serbs always tried to help the Jews, and how Jews and Serbs have a special bond of friendship, because both went through the same thing during the Second World War. You would hear these stories frequently among Serbian nationalists when discussing the war. But if we examine the history of Serbian-Jewish relations, we will get to see a more sinister and dark picture. Serbian anti-Semitism goes way back to the early 19th century, to the first Serbian uprising. Ever since then, there were Jewish pogroms and them being expelled from certain Serbian cities and areas. 
But since this video will focus on the Holocaust, I will not discuss that topic right now. This video aims to break the myth of this eternal Serbian-Jewish friendship born after the Second World War, and will showcase how the Serbian state, as well as the Serbian people, participated in the final solution alongside the Germans to exterminate the Jews once and for all from the territory of Serbia. It is indisputable that the executioners of the majority of Serbia's Jews were German army personnel and the regular police. However, the role of the Serbs as active collaborators in the destruction of the Jews has remained underexplored in the Holocaust literature. As I mentioned, the widely held belief is that the Serbian people helped the Jews in any way they could during the occupation. This was certainly true for some, yet a large segment of Serbian society willingly and enthusiastically joined in on the destruction of the Jews and profited immensely from their demise. I will be showcasing the many sides of this Serbian society and what their role was in the final solution, from the press to the Serbian Orthodox Church, exposing their true colors when it comes to the treatment of Jews, as the final chapter in this series. Shortly after Yugoslavia was occupied by the Axis powers, numerous Serbian collaborationist newspapers started printing articles aimed at furthering the hatred towards Jews, and the vast majority of the editors-in-chief of the newspapers engaged in fascist activities long before the Germans entered Belgrade, and another half of the press was controlled and funded by Dmitry Ljotic and his Boer party. Although these writings echo the spirit of National Socialism, the writers working for these newspapers were entirely Serbian, and there was no direct German influence in the press, and the themes were entirely Serbian, not German. Two of these newspapers, Nasha Borba and Obnova, proclaimed that Jews were the ancient enemies of the Serbian people, and that the Serbs should not wait for the Germans, but rather already begin with the extermination themselves. One article in Nasha Borba was titled The Struggle for Racial Purity, and one part states, quote, Never again shall Jews be physicians, pharmacists, lawyers, and judges in Serbia. End quote. Around the same time, the press started justifying their anti-Semitism by looking more towards history, stating how after the Serbian uprisings, Jews became a privileged minority, and numerous times stated how the Serbs engaged in pogroms to expel the Jewish menace, a task which they want to see through in the modern day. A well-known Serbian intellectual and volunteer in World War I at that time, Milorad Mojic, had written a book titled Serbian People in the Claws of the Jews, which was written before the Axis invasion and was ready to be printed in 1940, but due to political reasons it could not be published. After the occupation, Ljotic made sure to instantly start printing as many copies of his book as possible, and the press was highly praising Moit's work. Quote, with its 80 densely printed pages, this book is one more convincing and crushing proof of the catastrophic Jewish influence in the world in all areas of human activity and thought. Writing in a very clear way, Mr. Moj begins with an explanation of the Jewish liturgical works, the Torah and Talmud, the truest expression of the Jewish spirit, which contain all the perfidious manifestations of a pagan accursed thought." End quote. The press was the main source of feeding the population anti-Semitic conspiracies, aiming to rally the Serbian people against the Jewish menace, using both historical Serbian and Nazi literature and writings as their pillars. As I mentioned previously, the press was entirely run by both the government of National Salvation and the Zbor party, with the Germans not bothering to influence the newspaper, since they had faith in Nedic and his regime to effectively manage it. In October 1941, the Grand Anti-Masonic Exhibition was opened in Belgrade. The exhibition focused on an alleged Jewish Masonic Communist conspiracy for world domination and contained vicious anti-Jewish propaganda. 
it was funded directly by the city of Belgrade and prepared primarily by Serbs loyal to the Germans. The exhibition was organized by Lazar Prokic, who would then become the general director of the exhibition. Prokic was also a prominent member of Zbor and worked closely with Dmitri Ljotic, and this exhibition project of his would prove to be an enormous success in Belgrade. Reportedly, tens of thousands of Serbs, including Milan Nedic, attended the exhibition within its first few weeks. As many as 80,000 people visited the exhibition during its three-month run, which lasted until January 1942. The Serbian press even reported how shocking it was to see this many people at the exhibition. Quote, the interest in the anti-Masonic exhibition is surprising. People stand in long lines before the ticket office. Everyone would like to see the exhibition as soon as possible. However, it should be pointed out that the public is very undisciplined. It is pushy and in such a way makes the work of keepers of water and guides difficult. One cannot demand that the small rooms of the exhibition accept the whole of Belgrade at one time." End quote. Seeing how the exhibition was attracting such a large amount of people, the Serbian government started issuing out postage stamps of the exhibition in hopes of attracting even more Serbian citizens. And the press was also intensely advertising the exhibition by printing numerous posters to attract local citizens, by portraying the Jews as the source of all evil in the world, and advocated the humiliation and violent subjugation of the Jews by Serbs. Numerous prominent clerics within the Serbian Orthodox Church openly supported the Nazis and espoused theological justifications for the persecution of Jews. The interesting thing is, the Serbian Orthodox Church was already promoting anti-Semitic ideas all the way back in the 1930s before the occupation. In 1937, an unofficial publication of the Serbian Orthodox Church explicitly identified the Jews as the hidden force behind Freemasonry, capitalism, and communism. Quote, Jews are representatives of Masonry, Jews are representatives of capitalism, and Jews are representatives of the proletariat revolution. There are no differences between them in their outlook on the world. They are essentially only Jews and nothing else. Thus, the enemy is as sly as a serpent and appears in several forms. This is why he is dangerous." End quote. So it's no surprise that the, after the occupation, the Orthodox Church swore loyalty to the Nazi regime. Serbian nationalists would claim that they did this because of their own safety, that if they didn't, the Nazis would have killed all of them. This is unlikely for two reasons. Number one, the Orthodox Church already propagated anti-Semitic conspiracies long before the invasion, as I have demonstrated with the publication. And number two, it was not in the interest of the Germans to harm the Church. By purging the Orthodox Church, the Germans would push even more Serbs towards the Partisans, which would destabilize the region further. And the Church was never even required to support the final solution. They had the full right to stay neutral on the matter, but they didn't. In October 1941, in a highly publicized meeting between Milan Nedic and representatives of the Serbian Episcopal Synod, Metropolitan Josef, the acting head of the Serbian Orthodox Church, had promised full support from the Church. A few months later, Josef would ban Jews from converting to Orthodoxy, and by doing so, he destroyed for Jews a potential means of survival. A most striking example of Serbian Orthodox Church's anti-Semitism combined with historical revisionism is the case of Bishop Nikolai Velimirovic. He is revered by Serbs as a true prophet and viewed as one of the most influential church leaders after Saint Saba. To most Serbs today, he is a hero and a martyr because he had allegedly survived years of torture in the Dachau concentration camp. In truth, there is no evidence that he was ever tortured at Dachau. However, Velimirovic was an honored prisoner at the camp, meaning he lived in a special section in private quarters, dined on the same food as German officers, and even went to town under German escort. If anything, it was more like he was under house arrest rather than any concentration camp, since he was provided with everything he needed, as well as medical care. 
The interesting thing about him is that if we take a look at his writings from Dachau, we will see how he utterly despised and hated Jews, and his writings praised the protocols of the Elders of Zion for clearly identifying the true enemy of the Serbs. A section from his writings state, quote, Today, Europe is the main battlefield of the Jew and the Jew's father, the devil, against the Heavenly Father and against his only begotten son. All the modern European slogans were composed by Jews, who crucified Christ. Democracy, strikes, socialism, atheism, tolerance of all faiths, pacifism and communism. All this is done with the intention of debasing Christ, of destroying Christ. You should think about this, Serbian brethren, and accordingly, you should correct your thoughts, desires and needs." End quote. In 1944, Velimirovic was released from Dachau thanks to Dmitry Ljotic, and Velimirovic would always praise Ljotic and his Boer movement. And today, Bishop Velimirovic is canonized as an official saint by the Orthodox Church in Serbia since 2003. It is true that the majority of priests in Serbia primarily supported the Chetniks, but the central branch of the Serbian Orthodox Church in Belgrade were extremely loyal to Nidic and the Germans, and contributed in any way they could to assist in the final solution. Up until now, I have presented how Serbian society demonized Jews and encouraged conspiracy theories, but now let's focus on the actions committed by the Serbian state against the Jews themselves. Not long after his appointment as leader of the Serbian collaboration government, Adal Turna had offered Nidic a temporary resignation until the Jewish question was solved in Serbia, as a means of not staining his reputation. But surprisingly, Nedic refused, stating that he saw the Jewish issue with great importance and that he wanted to lead the extermination of Serbia's Jews himself. Milan Nedic played a decisive role in the persecution and destruction of Serbia's Jewish population, as both the Serbian State Guard and Ljotic's men assisted the Germans in destroying synagogues and desecrating Jewish cemeteries, and the Serbian volunteer corps in general proved to be a highly reliable auxiliary to the Gestapo. In early December 1941, the Saimiste concentration camp was opened, and within only three days, over 5,000 Jewish women and children were transported to the camp. The Nazis had delegated to the Serbian authorities the responsibility of providing food for the prisoners of the camp. With this arrangement, the Germans determined the kind and quantity of food to be provided, and Belgrade's Department of Social Welfare was responsible for the purchase and delivery of the food. The Serbian authorities, however, routinely provided less food than the Germans specified on purpose. Starvation in the camp was so rampant that the Jewish inmates appealed repeatedly to the Serbian authorities to just deliver the amount of food the Nazis themselves approved. But the city of Belgrade rejected their appeal and continued to provide the inmates less food than the Germans originally stated. Not long after, the final solution was executed at Saimiste, with mobile gassing vans arriving from Germany, and almost every day Jewish prisoners were loaded into the vans, being told that they were just getting resettled. Although the victims inside Saimiste had no idea what fate awaited them, outside the camp, the gassing van could hardly have been a secret to either the Serbian police or the citizens of Belgrade, as the pounding on the van's door and the muffled cries of the dying victims were daily heard issuing from this strange vehicle. Over 7,000 Jews perished in the Saimishta concentration camp, and local Serbian businesses profited from their deaths, because they would commonly buy their clothing for a cheap price and sell them to their customers. This was further expanded on nationwide, as the Gestapo made contractual agreements with numerous Serbian businesses to sell the clothes of the dead inmates. And so, in mid-1942, Harald Turna had proudly announced that Serbia was completely Jew-free, and with it Serbia became the first state in Europe to be declared so. In one year alone, 15,000 Jews were slaughtered in native Serbia, which was over 95% of the total Serbian Jewish population. The hundreds of Jews which did survive mainly hid out in rural parts of Serbia, but even after Serbia was declared to be Jew-free, the Serbian volunteer corps continued to hunt down Jews in rural areas, and they would always gain reward money for every Jew they captured. 
between 1942 to 1944, it's estimated that the Serbian Volunteer Corps had killed over 455 Jews in the rural areas of Serbia. Following the virtual extermination of Serbia's Jewish population, Nidic's government attempted to claim all Jewish property for the Serbian state, and according to German estimates, the government confiscated over 1 billion dinars, which was used to further fund the state guard and the Serbian nation. Like many things today regarding two peoples, many modern ideas of brotherhood and friendship through struggle or suffering came during the time of the Second World War, and its far-reaching, seemingly never-ending influences and consequences. One such idea, which truly only is a bland surface-level idea, is the myth of Jewish and Serbian brotherhood through blood in the Second World War, professed by both sides vying for political legitimacy or distancing from certain parts of their history. The latter more so than the former can be applied to the Serbian nation and their general national rhetoric when it comes to the Jews. However, not their people, because I feel the Serbian people themselves, even today, very rarely, if at all, feel connected to the Jews and see them neutrally. However, the Serbian nation and their government is the opposite. They continually profess brotherhood with the Jews in political atmosphere, be it on summits, in front of EU representatives or on social media, and the center point of that argument of brotherhood or friendship comes from the period of the Second World War, and more specifically the quote-unquote innocence of Serbian involvement in the Holocaust, and of the destruction of Croatia's Jews, in a genocide that also affected over 700,000 Serbs in Bosnia and Croatia. While National Socialism is generally an ideology which is the black sheep of politics and association with it is generally social suicide, the Serbian tenacity in which that political reputation is squeezed is near unprecedented. Serbs having used their revisionism, gated themselves away from Nazism and their past in World War II, and in that self-made innocence of collaboration, they have made themselves eligible to constantly refer to any and all political opponents, especially neighboring Balkan nations as Nazis, Croats, Bosniaks, Albanians, namely, and pointing towards things like the Albanian SS Skanderberg, the Bosnian SS Hanjar, and the Ustasha movement and so on. And thanks to this exact self-proclaimed innocence, the Serbs fooled themselves practically into thinking they never did anything wrong. By using the genocide of Serbs in the independent state of Croatia, they fabricated the eternal myth of Serbian innocence, that the Nazis wanted to exterminate all Serbs, and that the Serbs were the most innocent people in the war. You always hear about the events in Croatia, and just how evil the Ustasha's were, but never a word about everything I have talked about in the series. Thanks to the efforts of the Serbian government and Serbs to completely wash away their actions and claiming absolute innocence. As I have stated in the beginning of the series, it is not my intention to label Serbs as always having worked together with the Nazis, but rather expose their revisionism to completely disregard their collaborationist past, saying that it never happened or just saying that they had to in order to not get killed, while at the same time labeling Croats, Albanians and Bosniaks as active collaborators, pretending that they never did anything during that time. I would just like to thank everyone for supporting me in this project. Serbia's Secret War is as of now my biggest project on the channel, and the most intensely researched one as well. I would like to give a shout out to Gartik, who some of you may remember from the last podcast. He sent me many pictures, documents and led me to certain archives which contain a lot of information I used in this series. And with it, the last page has finally been turned on this series. So thank you all for sticking with me in this three-part project.